Welcome for the second leg of this uh, fascinating discussion. I'm Jan Jeronka from this college, and I have most distinguished lineup here today with two uh, local colleagues, one distinguished professor from Wilson College, the other from Balliol College, and old friend economist uh, um, uh, uh, Jim Rollo from Sussex, and, and Samuel Jenkins, who doesn't uh, require an introduction. You have the CVs here in the program, so I can start <coughs> without further ado as we uh, envisage with um, Dayton first. Thank you very much. Is that audible? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we had three brilliant snapshots of the political and economic scene just before lunch. And if I may just intervene very quickly and say that at the end of her uh, peroration, Calypso Nicolaidis said there should be a place for continental scholars in the UK. On Monday at 7.30 in the evening, um, I'm hosting in Wolfson College the pro-vice-chancellor for Brexit none other than Professor Alistair Buchan, but a different Alistair Buchan from the one who is well known to the IR community, who will talk at an open session on what Brexit means for us in Oxford and for you in particular as scholars. I just mentioned that. Um, it's a great privilege to be talking in this session, and I'd like to start with what may be the only optimistic moment of the afternoon. And that is, for historians, this is a great time to be alive. <laughs> we have some real change. The New York Times, in its gorgeous hysterical manner, called it Britain's primal scream. Uh, it's probably quite a good description. So there's a lot going on, and historians love to try and see what we can compare it with in our rather placid English history in the past. As a citizen, I fear we may be going from hubris to nemesis. The anti-globalization that was talked about is being match matched by an attempt at re-globalizing Britain in the words of the Tory party. I think I, I should put my cards on the table when the referendum took place. I was one of those who thought we should have a second referendum as and when the time came. I'm less confident now that that sort of time will come. I'm very much reminded of the wise words of one Con O'Neill, who at the time of Britain's application to join the European community said of the European community, we swallow the lot and we swallow it whole. Maybe the same sort of paradigm will affect us leaving. Um, so the moment for reversal has probably passed, which um, leaves me depressed and rather reluctant to join in political activity. I'm not a policymaker, and I'm not going to be an armchair strategist, partly because armchairs are usually too big for women as a start, but also because there ain't a lot of strategy about at the moment, as you may have noticed already. But what I want to do is to think and just make simply two points, because there are four speakers this afternoon. The first point I want to make, and the first argument, is that the mechanics of the referendum, as we've heard, were extraordinarily badly handled. And the relationship between prime ministers and their parties and the country over the European community has been one of the most um, unseeming dimensions of British politics in the last 50 years. The argument I'm going to make to begin with is that although badly handled, to me it was not entirely unexpected. I think that the cultural winds of empire and post-imperial adjustment have been blowing through this country far more vigorously than have the winds of Europeanism, European identity, and the so-called peace project. So in Calypso's uh, trilogy of interpretations, I guess I'm in the Exodus school. 
Um, just think back. It's a tradition of British foreign policy that those of us who did any British history learnt about was that Britain balanced from outside. We joined alliances as and when we needed to, to stand up to a stronger external force. But by and large, we wanted to play the puppeteer, to manage the relations of our continental partners without becoming too closely involved. You can think right back to the moment when the Germans started to think empire and the debates in, the Britain, in Britain were whether that they should stick with their continental empire on the European landmass or have an overseas empire as well. If you think about the debates about 1939 to move a bit closer forward, there was a serious debate which went as far as Churchill, although he never wrote about it much afterwards, as to whether Britain, by and large an imperial power, should become directly involved through alliance commitments to a European war. And then from 1960, when we started to debate the European community seriously, having been extraordinarily snooty about it in the 1950s, we weren't really sure in our own minds as to whether we were talking economics or whether we were talking politics. The economists and the commercial fellows, the businessmen, mainly in the Conservative Party, were very keen that new markets should be found within the European continent, that this was a major driver for British foreign policy. There was some talk about Australia earlier. I had a doctoral student, Andrea Benvenuti, who showed extremely clearly that in 1961, the Australians were furious about the first application, mm -hmm. as were many in New Zealand. Um, uh, in brackets, the Americans said that if the New Zealands were making such a fuss about their lamb, maybe they, the Americans, should just buy the lot and be done with it. Mm -hmm. By 1967, the Australian turn had occurred. The Australians were now much more interested in markets in the, closer to their own region. And I think we heard from David Vines that that was a change which really won't be reversed. Once we got into the European community, as Chris Hill so clearly explained, we used the political dimension, the other side of the imperial coin, the desire to see the European community as some sort of force multiplier as a way to project British power after the parallel and slow decline of empire. So we were very happy to encourage European political cooperation, which was a, for an informal mechanism to coordinate foreign policy, or what the French in English call political union, in the European Union and the European community in the 70s. But we were actually quite bad about adapting to change. And I find this one of the extraordinary phenomena of British society, that we have been very keen to tell East Europeans to adapt and change to the new European Union. But actually, we ourselves, when we joined, didn't see it as that kind of project. It was a project in which we would join, we would use, we would be instrumental about. But the expectation that it would change us as much as it might have changed other defeated countries in war was not there. And I think that impulse is as strong as any that has resided within our European politics since the 1970s and certainly since the end of the um, application process that took a very long time, 12 years. Alongside with that, is we have a bizarre post-imperial obsession with leadership. It wasn't just Macmillan and it wasn't George Brown, as his famous remark is, you've got to let us in because we have to lead, to lead them, that is the continental Europeans. It's a thread in post-imperial identity and culture in Britain that has extended right through and was most visibly and painfully obvious at the time of the Iraq invasion. I noticed it creeping back into 
the rhetoric from the Conservative Party, the rhetoric of leadership combined with the rhetoric of being some sort of rather improbable bridge to the United States. So that's my first point, that I think we need to set back. These are the roots of where we are now, in my own view. That it was badly handled, but there was a cultural reluctance. Reversing a pantechnicon onto a motorway is the expression I sometimes have used for undergraduate students. And once we were there on the motorway, we've been consistently reluctant to change the union in ways that might require great change by we ourselves. <coughs> the second point relates specifically to the target that I was asked to aim at, and which was the one that Chris Hill actually talked about beautifully, so I'm not going to go back over that again, is global Britain. Empire two pale shad shadow of what went before. I think it's not worth talking about Britain being here, Britain being there, Britain not being somewhere else. Let's go back to those base key drivers of what makes a foreign policy. It seems to me that on most of them, we are lacking that input. Territorial consensus. Well, um, Baroness O'Neill explained very well the dilemmas that we have there. We haven't talked about Scotland. We could. Secondly, the economy. You can't have a vibrant foreign policy without some sort of economic input. And I thought Dr. Dinger's slides, and I wish she'd talked for twice <coughs> as long, were extraordinarily illuminating. Between one and I think it was 9.5% um, drop. That's going to be quite hard for the British to manage a hands-on tout azimut foreign policy. It may even be quite hard for Britain to keep up its 2% in NATO, however you play with the figures. Secondly, the political will, the leverage to be a foreign policy actor. And here I turn to the nuclear issue. And it's quite extraordinary that the nuclear question, a bit like NATO, has buried itself very, very deep into the British psyche. When Corbyn made suggestive remarks against a nuclear deterrent, he was clearly sat upon somewhere. The, even the Labour Party now is back on track, as the traditionalists would have us believe. But that problem is compounded first by money, second by Scotland, where do you put your trident if Scotland goes, and third, the classic echo of the French dilemma, which way do you point the bloody things? It was easier in the Cold War, but not so much easier for the French. The third point is institutions. Since the Second World War, if not before, we have used institutions as a false multiplier. They have allowed us to exercise some leadership. They have allowed us to expand the range of our activities. It seems to me, and this was explained before, that within the UN, that capacity will not go away overnight, but will probably decline over time in the UN Security Council. In the common foreign and security policy and the common foreign defense policy, we put a lot of intellectual energy into that dimension of the European Union. If we are going to cherry pick over time, but probably not immediately, our influence will decline classic remark for IR theorists is that policy abhors a policy and power abhor a vacuum. If the British retreat, in time others will come. We have a trope in Britain that somehow the Continentals will get it all wrong by themselves. I think that that is probably mistaken. The same is true for the internal security dimensions through justice and home affairs. May thought she could cherry-pick, and she did cherry-pick, but within the context of the EU. 
I suggest to you that the capacity to leverage our institutional membership will reduce considerably. Uh, likewise with NATO. We think of ourselves as number two in NATO. Well, actually, the French increasingly think themselves as number two in NATO, and the Germans probably are number two in NATO. Much of what de goes on there will deter be determined by what goes on in the United States. So we are condemned to cooperate, but the psychological impact of pulling out, of turning our back, is not to be underestimated. If we want bilateral agreements, again, this is going to be harder now, I think, when we leave the European Union, not just with the French and the Germans, because the French have always picked Germany if it became a choice between Germany and Britain. And Germany has always picked France if it came to a toss-up between France and Britain. We are moving ourselves out of that frame. There's one last point I'd just like to mention very quickly before I stop, and that's cybersecurity. There has been some mention of Five Eyes and the Anglo-American plus ex-Commonwealth links. Um, there is a new institute for technology and global strategy that's been set up in Oxford, and its director, Lucas Kello, sent me really very interesting information about where he thought we were on this. The picture I got from him is that technically, and in terms of cooperation, we can probably do quite well. We are ahead of the EU in that game. But I have to say, Five Eyes is a WASP institution. It's extraordinarily dated. And if you don't know what WASP is, it means that you're of a generation. That's a very good thing. You don't know what it means. You can ask later on. So I can't see that cyber security is going to become the great go-to sell for domestic consumption area of British post-Brexit foreign policy. Now, I started off with some optimism as a historian, but I'm afraid when you come to look at the structure of how foreign policies are made when countries disentangle themselves and have no real policy, there's no three circles, there's no policy, there's no strategy, there's no grand strategy yet. And just remember that Winston Churchill's three circles was an anti-Soviet strategy. People read paragraph one of his speech and tend not to read paragraph two. So I'm afraid I land up, like many of my colleagues, on a pessimistic note. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um... We're covering a fair amount of what, what we are trying to look at in the se session, namely relationship with the rest of the world with views from Britain and Anne already has um, very well picked out some of the sort of historical themes, and I, I kind of want to follow that, maybe laying a slightly different emphasis. Um, I want to start by, in a sense, pointing out the obvious, which is the recalcitrance of the world to political action and to political choice. Um, of course, it may be true of all politics that what politicians can do is highly constrained, um, but it's a defining feature of international politics that volunteerism will take you very little way. Why? Well, because what comes out will always be the result of what other people do, what other people think, how other people look at you. Most, maybe all, strategic failures come from having got not you wrong, but other people wrong. And secondly, because of the power of the great grand systemic forces of our time. In the 1990s, there was a particular reading of those under a heading of globalization, and obviously some of the things that drove or were seen to drive that um, are very real and make sense, new technologies and so on. Um, but the core of much of what those systemic forces are have to do with the big forces that have shaped global Western modernity, namely global capitalism on the one hand and geopolitical and international political competition on the other. And the other feature, I think, that got discussed in the 1990s version of those global forces was, of course, everyone talked about the global. Uh, but I don't think that Europe, more generally, as well as 
uh, Britain has fully taken on board uh, the extent to which we live in a far more global world. And that notion of where Europe fits in a very different kind of global world is part, I think, of the context that we need to think about. Partly seeing the Brexit choices against a longer-run discussion in British foreign policy about how it would adjust to its changing role, and partly, and really very crucially, because the choices involved in Brexit are not different in kind from the choices involved in doing things in other places of the world. And this is particularly true when we come to global governance, global economic governance, trades negotiations, uh, so on and so forth. There is a mythology that there is a sovereignist-based way of doing these things, which is fundamentally different in kind from the choices that are involved in deep regional integration. So I want to sort of play out some sort of longer-run context and see where it kind of leads. Um, Anne will be very fully justified in correcting my sort of very schematic and simplistic view of post-war British foreign policy. But I think what we obviously see is a deep tension between awareness of the decline of relative power and a really quite sophisticated ongoing discussion about how Britain might uh, best adapt. Um, but with this astonishing belief that relative decline doesn't really undermine Britain's capacity to be a big and major player. So obviously we can find sort of endless examples of the awareness of decline, just sort of take the Beryl Report in, in 77, you know. There is very little that diplomatic activity can, can do to reverse the decline in British power. But on the other side, you know, Harold Wilson in 64, we are a world power or we are nothing. Or the national security strategy in 2010, reject, we must reject any notion of the idea of a shrinkage of our influence. Sort of, you know, very strange ambiguity that has been so central to British foreign policy and which clearly has not gone away in current discussions. So a lot of ambiguity, but also a lot of consensus. Alternatives which might have been there are put to one side. The Duncan Report in 69 had an explicit section on Britain as a greater Switzerland, not in the sort of technical Brexit sense, but in the bigger role of a kind of independent, much more disconnected, I say neutral country, and rejected it. Equally, the sort of on the left, the idea of a much more unilateralist withdrawal has never um, gained uh, particular ground. And of course, post-Cold War, many of the proponents of that view rushed off to become liberal crusaders and liberal internationalists. Um, so there's been that sort of ambiguity. What is striking, if, if, if sort of the ignorance and the lack of knowledge of what goes on in Europe is one of the themes of the Brexit debate, the sort of absence, as Anne said, of any real clear strategic debate about the bigger picture is, is equally surprising. We have a lot of sort of bluster and a lot of rhetoric. Um, we have a fair number of sort of fantasists around sort of recreating Anglo worlds um, and so on, but we don't have a great deal of really concrete discussion about what the, how the world has changed and where Britain has fitted in. And there are some institutional reasons, again, not just related to Brexit for that, but magnified by Brexit. The relative bureaucratic loss of influence of the FCO relative to DFID, relative to intelligence, relative to the MOD is clearly a factor there. So let me just highlight sort of five features quickly um, under which this discussion from the past might connect with where we are. The first is obviously Europe. And we've talked about that. But again, you can quote, say, Beryl in 77, the Beryl Report, which stresses that Europe is the bridge, the multilateral bridge, the bilateral bridge to broader um, influence. And we've heard about the difficulties that will inevitably arise if one has to think of influence either through a different kind of bridge or through alternatives to that bridge. Again, not totally new. Uh, one of the features of Hague in the FCO was sort of not a, a move away from institutions, but a greater emphasis on networks, partnerships, looser sorts of things. So, so it's not, you know, again, something that's sort of been there um, before, um, but really very difficult to see where that goes uh, and use the phrase force multiplier, that notion of Britain through Europe achieving uh, greater influence. Um, Europe has never been just about aggregation. Europe has also been about power through what it is. This is most obvious in the area of um, economic regulation. You don't just negotiate standards. If you are big, 
they are the standards that other players have to take on board in terms of how multinationals deciding how they operate. So that form of power, the power to negotiate, again, we're just rediscovering how difficult it is to have the technical capacity to play the game of complex economic governance. We haven't said very much about NATO. Um, obviously, NATO is held out as well. We don't need to worry too much because there's NATO. Well, you know, we can take different views of NATO, but the idea that NATO is this solid, secure institution that does not itself face major challenges, I think, is clearly problematic. And here we need, I think, to put on the table, again, when one thinks of Europe not looking from Britain out or from Europe out, but thinking about where Europe fits, to the gradual move in terms of how we see Europe, to Europe becoming, probably for the first time since the mid-19th century, a secondary region geopolitically in the global system. And that has immense implications, including, we'll hear maybe later, for the United States. The key date is not 1941. The key date is 37, 38, when the United States moves to a Europe-first policy. That idea that the fundamental and most important thing that matters is Europe. Asia and everything else is secondary. And that's really what the recurring themes and discussion about pivots to Asia are all about. So Europe and not having Europe or change Europe is a real problem in terms of where we've come and where we might go. Um, military, what obviously one of the ways in which Britain was going to play this game of being a continued great power was to lay particular emphasis on its capacity to step up to the plate, to punch above its weight and all of those sorts of things. Um, this isn't, of course, so easy, partly because of the limits on the effective use of military power in a world where agency is much more diffused, where mobilization is much more complex, partly because of the defeats uh, that the United States, Britain, the West have, f have faced in the post-Cold War period, um, and partly because, again, quite extraordinarily, the extent to which conservative governments have really done a great deal to undermine Britain's effective military capacity of the kind that it relied on to play in this particular game. Thirdly, soft power. I won't talk about soft power. Chris is here and has written lots about it. Um, it's a very old idea. The Plowden Report in 64 talked about the importance of persuasion and cultural assets if Britain was going to maintain its role. I think all one could say is, if this is true, it needs a lot of investment and there are a lot of things going on now which make it hard to square the idea that there's going to be global influence on the back of soft power. Fourthly, institutions, so beyond um, Europe, and Anna's mentioned this already, and let me just unpack a little further. Um, much of the role Britain has had has obviously been built on the residues of the past, uh, Security Council membership, special roles in Bretton Woods institutions. And here, again, as Anne said, over the long run, whenever we don't know, but the global character of the system is going to push away from that. Um, alternatives, again. It's not just Europe that is in trouble. It's not just NATO that's not looking too good. Institutions and multilateralism generally is not uh, looking particularly good, driven in the northern world by these two processes of politicization, domestic politicization, you know, anti-globalization, and also international political a geopolitical um, politicization. The G20, which of course was a great triumph on the part of Brown of creating new adaptive institutions to solve problems, underscores just how phenomenally difficult it is to embed an effective institution as a m means of multilateral manage management. So under challenge, institutions though are unavoidable, and I think various people have mentioned this, Chris um, mentioned it, certainly, they're unavoidable, but their character well, unavoidable, we've got to be careful with unavoidable. We could imagine a deep fundamental rupture with globalization that might change something. But barring that sort of deep rupture, the notion that the modern global capitalist system requires and depends on deep and dense institutions, there's a very powerful Cobdenite sort of reflex in British foreign policy thinking. You know, Cobden, to what do we owe the success of our trade, the cheapness of our manufactures. You know, as List and the McCantlist said, this is nonsense. This is not why to what you owe your, the success of your trade. And today the counter would be the economy doesn't function except on the back of immensely detailed regulated regulatory agreements. You know, this is the point of waiving these other agreements. You know, NAFTA is 28,000 pages of text 
TPP was a volume like this. And this is not something that is just common to regional integration. It's something much more general. And it involves the loss of sovereignty. And it involves all of the trade-offs in setting up supranational courts. The number of courts in the world has moved to 38 because somebody has to manage those things. And of course, that is exactly the problem with thinking and offering the idea that there are easy choices out there. So institutions under challenge, institutions unavoidable, institutions following maybe from both of those things, immensely fluid. Calypso uh, mentioned uh, this. We're seeing great institutional fluidi fluidity, which offers obviously potential opportunities, but also huge risks. And why? Let's just take trade, and I'm sure Jim can say this probably talk about this much more professionally than I, I can. I mean, what's the big story of the WTO? Well, the old northern industrialized world has progressively lost control over the agenda of the WTO. New powers have come up which have achieved veto power, but with enormous difficulties of reaching productive bargains. What, are, what does the United States do in, that, in response to that? Well, it seeks new alternatives. It seeks regional alternatives or it seeks trans-regional alternatives. That's what TPP and TTIP are all about. Um, but again, to la labour the point, there is no stable WTO world of global economic regulation there. It is immensely stable and it's immensely under challenge. And then the final point on institutions is about mixed motives. Um, yes, we do regulate and we want to regulate and it's very difficult to avoid thinking of regulating the changing global economy. The electronic commerce chapter of TPP is not going to go away in whatever sort of bigger forum it finds itself eventually. Somebody has to think of how we regulate electronic commerce and all of the battles, interest battles, uh, are going to be around that. But it's not just about economic regulation, it's also about geopolitics. That's the mixed system we're in. TPP was about containing China as well as regulating the global economy. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to talk about my fifth point, which was partnerships. We've raised that, I think, already. Um, the idea of, well, let's go and do new bilateral partnerships, particularly with the emerging world. But just the point there is that that rhetoric has been going at least since Jim O'Neill started. And we have seen a great deal of effort in terms of building strategic partnerships with the emerging world. And it is immensely difficult. And over a 10-year period, not much has been achieved except to learn of the things that you can't easily get and we heard again the reasons why it's difficult to get easy deals on complex trade deals with emerging countries, but also, again, because of the way that power has changed. Think about migration. I think it's a very nice example. The first half of the 20th century, as new non-Western powers arose, particularly Japan, Japan wanted to put the migration issue on the agenda. Think of racial equality. Think of the, black, the, the battles over the rights of Asians in Australia and Canada. Post-45, the West was able to put that in the box, nail it down, close it off. What happens now as the non-Western world enters into negotiations? We go to India, and the Indian government says, not surprisingly, we care about the diaspora. We care about the rights and so on and so forth. So power shifts. The challenge, I think, and maybe I am going to be a little bit more optimistic, is we're settling into a world of a discussion where it's all about the nationalists and the globalizers. And I think if we're going to see anything protect productive come out both of thinking within Europe and thinking outside Europe, it's that we have to get away from that either or. The globalizers have to realize just how much has failed, just how much their 1990s view of globalization hasn't worked and is very un much less likely to work in the, favor, in the future. And Britain certainly outside Europe, has some impulses, Han mentioned maybe the negative ones or the limiting ones, but it has some which I think do fit the world. A world which, in which, for example, law and institutions needs to be far more pragmatic, far more pluralist, far more adjusting to the shifts in the nature of power is something deep in the British foreign policy tradition, arguably far less so, either in the Europeanist view of where Europe fits in the world, or indeed in the national diplomatic and legal cultures of many of the member states. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I remember many years ago in this room, Douglas Hurd argued that Britain should punch its weight. We will hear all about this from Simon Jenkins. <laughs>
thank you for inviting me back. Uh, I think when I was last here, um, I was in a minority of one, um, uh, uh, and I'd probably be in a minority of one again. i just come back from America, and I was hoping, and I think I was expected to say something about the American uh, view of Brexit. Um, having spent um, the last week in New York, I can bring piece of one very firm piece of news. They are completely and utterly uninterested in Brexit. Um, I've never come across a city less interested in a subject than um, New York and America generally is in Europe at the moment. They are interested in one thing only and nothing else. Uh, football's gone. Everything's gone. They just want to talk about Trump. Uh, and um, and it, it is very difficult, actually, as an outsider um, to, 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 to know... Would you, are you supposed to sympathise? Are you supposed to quarrel with them? Are you supposed to look on the bright side? Um, uh, you just commiserate? Uh, um, but New York in particular uh, is, is, is obviously a, a, an almost universally non-Trump part of America. Um, and all I could do, just by way of, 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 of um, reporting, I suppose, is that there was a sense in which I felt I'd gone from one uh, politics of trauma to another <laughs> politics of trauma, um, and were there any parallels between these two traumas? Um, uh, uh, Am saying she felt very depressed and uh, gloomy and so on. Um, uh, and I think uh, that that's possibly an academic uh, response to a particular situation. Uh, as a journalist, I find it rather exhilarating. Um, uh, nothing is ever dull at the moment. Uh, there's never been so much to write about. There's never been so much unpredictable. Um, it, is, it is really bloody interesting, is all I can say. Um, uh, we had great arguments in America. Um, I said, look, it's easy for you. You've got four years, you get rid of the guy. Uh, we've got, we're, we're, we're living with Brexit um, forever, uh, for the foreseeable future, um, so you should be commiserating with us rather than mo mooning on about your own problems. Um, but um, but uh, it, it, that didn't go down very well. Um, uh, the, 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 um, the thing that does rather interest me is what I can only describe as the, the political analysis of trauma this kind of apocalyptic approach to a particular set of affairs. Um, uh, and I hate to play a generational card, which you should never play, particularly in uh, academic circles, I'm sure. Um, if you have lived through these things before, you honestly do see them slightly differently. A lot of young people, including my own children, think that the, that the world is falling apart. I mean, they use words like that. And I say things like, you know, I can remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. We wondered if St. John's College was going to be there when we came back in the afternoon. Um, we genuinely thought that nuclear war was a possibility. Uh, we, we, we lived through one of these um, upheavals after another. I always remember the, the um, Britain in the 19, early 1970s, uh, when we were on four-day weeks. Uh, the country was, quote, ungovernable. Um, uh, they were really bad times. Um, and the only truth I ever read in that, in that period from a generally hysterical press was a letter in the Times protesting about an editorial in the Times. And the editorial had said, um, uh, the country is going to the dogs, we're finished, Britain's no good, um, we're, we're a minority power now, the economy is collapsing, the unions are running everything, it's a catastrophe. Uh, sir, I read your editorial with great interest, I disagree with it very strongly, it's abundantly clear that Britain will do what it's always done in these circumstances, it will muddle through, yours sincerely. Um, it's exactly what happened. Um, we muddled through somehow. You got over it. Something else came along. Um, we started talk talking about football or cricket, and uh, we'll get through this one, I'm convinced. Now, that's slightly why I became intrigued by my own response to Brexit. To, uh, to basically, how, I was, how, was I going to, how was I going to write about it? How was I going to vote? I wrote about it by writing about um, for Brexit one week and against Brexit the next week, and I kept that up for about two months um, until the strain began to tell, I have to say, not least of my readers. Um, but but it, was, it was an interesting exercise because I was deliberately trying to put myself in the, in, in the mind of the other side of the argument. <clears throat> and I, I have to say, both in NYU last week and to a certain extent when I've come back to Oxford, um, I, I kind of, there's almost a suspension of academic objectivity. Um, you know, we are gloomy. Well, your job isn't to be gloomy. Your job is to analyse what's happening and tell us uh, how to find a way through it. Um, uh, and the idea that, that this, this business of... of I suppose scholarly bias, um, is wrong. I think one, one ought to look as clearly as one can about why things are as they are and help those people who are trying to f formulate policy uh, to find a way through it. Now, at the time, um, <clears throat> I, I, I've studied economic history at Oxford, um, and I've always thought the thing about economic history is it does muddle through. Uh, if, for the sake of the argument, we were to withdraw from the EU, we'd find a way of muddling through. God knows how, but... You withdraw, you've got to muddle through. You will muddle through. There will not be great queues at Dover for some reason or another. We will muddle through. 
What did tell with me, and I think this is relevant to this session, was I spent a week just before the Brexit vote in Germany um, with some uh, colleagues in Berlin. Um, and I'll never forget, I forget most things, but I'll never forget a dinner uh, we had with uh, some journalists and some um, MPs uh, in Berlin about two weeks before the vote. And they turned on myself and one or two other people from Britain um, with a kind of passion. And they said, please, please, please don't leave the EU. Um, and I said, well, <clears throat> I don't think it's going to make a big difference. It will be around. We're not drifting off. We're going to be you know, dealing with you. We'll buy Mercedes, I'm sure. Um, and they said, that's not the issue. The issue is you'll leave us in charge. And, and that, that was what really told with them. I don't know if there are any um, Germans here, but they, they, were, they, were, they felt so strongly that they, they should not be left in charge. Uh, we're a young country, they said. It's not true, but they said it. Um, uh, we, are, um, we are behaving badly in the Eurozone. Um, we're uh, bullying. Um, we are um, stranded by France being as inadequate as it is. Um, we haven't confidence in our own democracy yet. Um, we need you with us to reform Europe because we know Europe's a mess and it's partly a mess because of us. So it was a very sort of um, extrovert way of looking at um, German power in Europe. But they were very emphatic. You mustn't, you mustn't desert us. You, you, uh, you British and we Germans and other like-minded countries um, now owe it to Europe. Uh, we've done 50 years of success. We've just got to get this thing back on the road properly. And that did tell with me. I mean, the politics mattered. The economics didn't matter. The economics would sort themselves out. The politics possibly wouldn't sort themselves out. So when you make a decision about politics, it does matter. Um, and I came away from that whole experience thinking, we're always told, um, you know, it's the economy stupid, the Clinton-esque phrase. Um, it's not the economy stupid. Uh, my friend Jonathan Haidt, a political psychologist in America, um, written a great book about why people very rarely vote their pocketbook. They vote security. They vote all kinds of other things. They vote their identity. Uh, they vote their gender. They vote for weird reasons. Nowadays, few people are starving. They don't usually vote their pocketbook. And that's why so many um, poor people in America vote Republican. Uh, uh, and this seemed to me to be a, a, a significant insight. Because it really did mean that, 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 um, that when, we, when we make these decisions, as people made that decision over Brexit, um, the assumption that people were being stupid because they're going to lose money was, was arrogant on the part of those people who were on, on the Remain side. Um, the, 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 the endless, the thing I found most offensive after Brexit was this, this deluge of insults, not least from my own newspaper, of people who voted leave. It was, it was, it was sort of toffee-nosed arrogance. It was patronising. Uh, you're so stupid for voting leave. Why are you so stupid? It went on and on and on and on. Um, and it's the same in America now with Trump. Um, how could you be so stupid as to vote for Trump? Well, people have very complicated answers to that question. And your job as academics is to find out what those answers are and to try and to see what you can do about it. But they did vote, and we did vote in that way. And I think the ob obligation now is to try and work out what we can do with it. And the, the, the chief uh, point of optimism, which I had to end with, was, was in, in, obviously in, in, in Macron's victory in France, um, uh, Merkel's apparent impending victory in Germany, uh, two strong leaders, relatively strong leaders, in a position to do something about Europe and saying so. Um, it's absolutely essential for Britain, um, and I think I find most unattractive about Brexit at the moment, is this, is this belligerence in it. It's the sense that you know, we, 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 we're going to get those bastards in Europe. Um, that is not sensible. A, it's bad negotiating tactics, I think. But secondly, in two years' time, Britain outside Europe, Germany and France inside Europe, are going to be the three most powerful countries in Europe anyway. And they have a huge obligation on their shoulders, a huge obligation to reform Europe in such a way that I think one day we'll be back inside. Thank you very much. all about economics, but maybe <laughs> economics is not totally relevant to this. Jim will tell us. Thanks very much, Jan. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, thank you very much for this morning, which I thought was a uh, superb set of uh, presentations. Um, and the real economics has all been done um, uh, by Shvati. Um So I'm not going to go over that sort of journey. Like Anne, this is my time again 
not again, but this is my time because I've been a trade policy person since 1968, roughly speaking, maybe 1966, somewhere around then. At all times, I mean, part of the choice to join the EU was partly a choice about trade policy. Um, and I worked in the Ministry of Agriculture at that time. Um, I was a member of the accessions team at, uh, at, at that time. I had the very high-ranking job of assistant economist on eggs and poultry. Um, but we had to get really deep into this subject because it was a very complicated story in trade terms and various other terms. And that led, taught you a lot. I learned a lot of lessons in the Ministry of Agriculture and Economics of Intervention, most of them about things to avoid. Um, uh, but here we are now, finally, when I thought, really, my career was over. Um, you know, I was just uh, doing, puddling around, doing things that, that somewhat interested me in a marginal sort of way. And suddenly we're confronted with the first opportunity probably since the abolition or, or the, uh, the, the end of the, the Cornwalls, um, to have a real look at what we want to do with trade policy. Um, now I don't know how this is, how does this, what do I need to do? Sorry, Simon. Um, <laughs> just keep talking. Just keep talking. Well, that's the other thing to do. Um, thanks. So I thought I would just spend a little time asking this question about what do we think trade policy is for in this country. Now, I'm very old, so I write notes to myself and call them PowerPoint slides. Um, and I'm not going to cover all, everything on this page, partly because I can't read it any better than you can um, at this point. But the key point I want to get at from the beginning is that trade policy is not, except in its implementation, about foreigners. It's domestic policy expressed through that, um, that lens of how do we how do, we do that. Um, and it has lots of purposes. I mean, when we had supposedly unilateral free trade in this country in 1860, we still had three tariffs, which was responsible for a very large chunk of tax revenue. So much so that the big argument, as I understood it, between the liberals and others was, what should we do about income tax? if we lose tariff revenue. And that's still true in Africa, for example. Lots of countries depend on, on that. So if you're talking about tax, you really are at the heart of the domestic state. Um, it, it, seems, it seems to me. Um, and so I take that as, as the first step. The second question was, well, what sort of policy could we have? Um, and, you know, what would my ideal be? Well, what are the choices? <coughs> I found that quite um, hard to get my, get my head around for quite a long time. And I think about it now, for the moment at least, in, in the context of competition. How we set the terms of the game in markets in, uh, in our domestic state. How we manage um, uh, the whole policy of uh, maximizing our output, getting rid of, of um, failing um, companies and so on. And trade plays a really key part in that. And while um, I, you know, I hide from no one in my um, dislike of some of Patrick Minford's um, uh, ideas and interventions, I think at this point, we really do have to go back and ask ourselves if there's a ground zero here from which we can, we, we can move forward, which is um, of unilateral free trade. Um, I don't think, and you know, you'll see um, um, that some will further down, I make the um, up on this. Sorry, there's about six hidden slides here, which I'm not going to impose on you, uh, which goes through each of these. But just to say, of course, the political economy is lousy. The political economy is lousy because the export lobby hasn't got any ammunition to offer foreigners by way of access to their money. And this is not, um, this is not just economists thinking about you know, imagining these things. When we had unilateral free trade, first of all, we had the Anglo-French treaty. It's hard to say Anglo-French given the Scottish ones. And we were affected by it. But, uh, but nonetheless, 
the Anglo-French Treaty, um, and that was the first step on a, quite a wide range of linked um, trade agreements across, across Europe. Um, but that lost traction. And it lost traction partly because the UK had nothing to offer in terms of market access to the Italians and others because we were already given it all away unilaterally in, the, um, in this context. And the, the government was receiving complaints from manufacturers <laughs> that they needed something to allow them to open up European markets um, in the late 19th century. So, so it does seem to be that that, that is the problem one has with, with, with that sort of policy. When it comes to it, uh, we, 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 we take what we get and governments don't like being left exposed um, to that extent. Of course, you can have selective unilateral uh, free trade. There's an argument that said selective unilateral free trade has been the most common form of trade in the post-war world, particularly in developing countries. If you took India as an, as an expression of that, their bound tariff in the WTO is about 70% average tariff. The actual applied tariff is now somewhere around 12%. That was something they did not under pressure from the WTO, but because it was part of the internal reform uh, process that, 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 that was necessary. Um, uh, so, but again, that is unilateral. It pays no attention to what foreigners think or speak and asks nothing of them. Um, then we can move into a different set of, of stories about competition uh, by reciprocal liberalization. And why do we do this? This is the way in which you buy off um, uh, or create a counter lobby to the uh, import substitution lobby that doesn't like open borders. Um, and, uh, and by, by enervating the, uh, if that's the right word, um, well, they're all on the golf course on a Friday afternoon, as, as the Minister of Trade suggests. I think we do need innovating um, in this context. But getting, getting them to argue for the benefits of free trade being exports and jobs. Um, uh, that, however, can so sometimes sort of push into a, a sort of fully mercantilist approach, and we're seeing elements of that from the Trump um, uh, administration. They're looking to raise uh, uh, tariffs against Mexico, against um, uh, China, and so on, and use that as a lever to open foreign markets. Um, uh, so that's another set of areas we put. Export left growth. I mean, that has been the story of the post war global economy, starting with Germany, um, finishing so far with, well, not finishing, now with China in full flow. Uh, Southeast Asia going down that direction. India even having got out of the Hindu rate of growth um, and so on. And uh, so that's another perfectly respectable. Now, uh, out to David on, on macroeconomics, but export-led growth has a macro aspect to it. It's about the compression of consumption. You do that two ways, and maybe you use both of them. One is through essentially um, uh, tax and, in, and, and, uh, and interest rate policy. The other is in perhaps indirect, more indirectly through the exchange rate. Um, but nonetheless, it means, if you look at China, China for the last two decades, consumption was about 40%, less than 40% of GDP. And here it's over 60. In the US it's a pushing 70. So you can see that that was a real um, compression. Um, those circumstances. And that meant real sacrifices in, in a real way across, um, <coughs> across uh, the countries that practiced it. Um, and Germany, arguably, you know, have a little bit of, of um, um, sympathy for some of the American comments on, on German policy. And if I had Greek, I would have even more. Um, uh, because that is, there is some element there of, of undervalued exchange rates being acquiesced in at very least. Um, uh, so those are sort of, con how to put it, complete policies in themselves. There's another set of policies where um, trade is linked, partly either because we want to 
um, spread our values. So trade and uh, labor standards, trade and human rights, uh, trade and the environment. Um, uh, some of that might actually be uh, trying to offer some uh, um, protection to domestic firms that have been forced to implement what might be costly regulation for them, which their foreign competitors don't, don't have to. But that's the point. Of course, the truth is that in most, world, in most countries, we are facing a path-dependent story about how trade policy is made. It's made incrementally, um, usually. And in most countries' trade policies, you can see some mix of these. Um, I suppose what I was hoping for was that the government would come out and make a clear statement that this is one of these was the sort of way they wanted to go. Um, uh, let me... This can be summarized by simply saying the, the tools of trade policy is domestic market access. It's what you can offer your trade partners. I say this in the current sense, and that's true whether you're in the WTO, where it's multilaterally done. If you're in, I don't know, the TPP, which is a sort of preferential plurilateral agreement, then again, you can... Um, you need, uh, each other need to be have this swap of, 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 of market access. Um, uh, so that, again, uh, when you're in uh, preferential or, or other forms of, of uh, free trade agreement, um, they're um, right. So I now get these black bits just a second. Okay, so what is British trade policy? I have been over all the documents, I've read all of the, of the uh, speeches. Um, it comes down to three slogans, as far as I can tell. One is Global Britain. Uh, now, you know, if, uh, if I were Peter Mandelson, I would be suing the Prime Minister because he invented something called Global Europe in uh, 2007, I think, when he rewrote the trade policy uh, strategy for the EU. Britain as the champion of in brackets, global free trade. Um, and then finally, and this seemed to remind me of my children's uh, uh, from a long time ago, um, uh, breakfast uh, cereals, you know, exporting is great, is the slogan. That, uh, everyone ought to get up and do it. Um, I can see the tiger coming in through the door. Okay. So what do, these, what do these sort of add up to? And this is based pretty much on what uh, Mrs. May said. Um, and you know, it's a policy aimed at replacing the trade we have lost um, with the EU. Now let me just draw a baseline here. There are two things you might want to keep in mind in the rest of this. One is the first move in our trade policy was to increase protection. We decided we would not be a member of the um, uh, customs union, and we wouldn't be a member of the single market. That was made very clear in, 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 that, in that speech. Um, and that means that trade costs are going to go up. Some of this is quite technical, but if you're not in the single market, uh, you don't get the, uh, the, the recognition that, of your products as being EU products. And that means you have to prove that they're EU products. This is called conformity assessment. Well, sorry, it's rules of origin and also conformity assessment. Um, so these two, th these two uh, measures add to the cost. Currently, you don't incur these costs. The direct effect of... Um, EU law means that the customs officers have no need to look inside the box um, uh, in this. Um, so so that's, the, that's a key point. The other key point to keep in mind is we are an 80% services economy. Services are about half. There's a measurement problem, as you might expect, with services, but there are two types of measurement problems. And what if anyone showed you some statistics of services trade, you're only looking at, looking at two out of the four key categories in services trade. Um, you're looking at cross-border um, trade um, when the service crosses borders, like 
down the telephone line or whatever, or where the consumer crosses the border. Where the firm crosses the border, a bank goes, sets up in Delhi or whatever, that doesn't register. We don't get anything um, in, on the trade statistics like that. When uh, teams or construction teams go across a border to build a building, which is an import of construction services, um, that doesn't get, get measured either. That's so-called, that's mode four. That, that will be quite, quite important. Well, that's, when you talk about that, you mean you're talking about visas, some form of visa. Um, and that's where Mrs. May's initial talks with the Indian Prime Minister about the great future of Indo-British trade fell over on its face. She was saying how slow the EU was, and it was made clear to her it was slow because the Brits didn't want to give the Indians any uh, visas to send teams of workers for whatever, I mean, I, high-grade IT workers, whatever. They just were, they're going to disappear into the, into the British community. So, you know, that um, is something that, that, that uh, makes it quite difficult um, for people trying to make agreements with, with the rest of the world. We want something deep, something that deals with services where we're competitive, um, but the point at which they say, yes, but so do we, we immediately run into, in, into a problem um, on, on that. Um, uh, but the targets that the Prime Minister pointed at were the US and Japan, the BRICS, um, implicitly ASEAN and the Gulf states as, as well. When I come, I'm going to show you some numbers in a moment or two, but, but, but don't get scared, they're not hard ones like, like Spartans. Um, they're quite, quite straightforward. But it's worth remembering, okay, I'll be very quick. Um, it's just worth remembering that it's not just that 47% of our, uh, that's the last, that's the latest year, that's up to February this year, 12 months up to February this year. 47% uh, of our exports go to the um, EU. Another 15 to 20% go to the countries the EU, and we, for the moment, have a free trade area with. All right? So we're actually the EU dependent share is truthfully somewhere of the order of 60 um, plus, uh, plus per percent. Um, and we lose, lose access to those agreements on the first day of Brexit. Um, so that's something we're going to have to negotiate, negotiate to get back in place. That might be easy, it might be hard, but we're talking of 55 countries. <coughs> so it's not going to be something we're going to do in a, you know, in a, in a weekend um, uh, against that background. Um, there are also 92 developing countries that are covered by something called the generalized system of preferences that we need, we're going to have to cover. Um, uh, in, 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 in due course. Um, and finally, thinking about ourselves again, we have to remember that uh, the regions uh, of the UK have they're quite different economic and <laughs> export structures. Um, and their policy preferences are going to be quite different from the UK governments. That's already clear with the scores. Um, a global champion for free trade, um, well, this comes out two ways. One, when they're in Geneva at the WTO, they say this is about making multilateral trade work. The rest of the time, it's actually back to global, global Britain. It's a different way of, expre of expressing. Um, these are not necessarily inconsistent, but they, are, they, do, they do clash to, to some more. They do clash some more. And for a long time, the WTO and before at the GATT thought that bilateral agreements, like the ones we want to pursue, are, um, are anathema to the WTO. Um, uh, and uh, we're, they were quite, quite hostile um, to them. Now, you know, I'm not against ministers trying to ride two horses at once. Ernie Bevan, I think, I'm willing, I could hear him saying it in my head, um, was allegedly when accused of, of, of having two contradictory um, policies, said, if you can't ride two horses at once, you shouldn't be in the circus. Um, and that's part of, uh, of, of the story. Okay. Um, and exporting is great. It's all based on we, we haven't got as many exporters as the, as the, rest, as the rest of the world. 
Um, so basically what we're looking at is improving export promotion. And we've just published a book, well, no, we've published a blog um, from the UK Trade Policy um, uh, Observatory, which shows that some of the, the Department of International Trade Policies are capable of increasing exports. Um, and this is quite a careful bit of uh, serious uh, uh, analysis. Um, we've got to try and encourage innovation. Well, nothing very new about that, but it tells you we're heading in that direction. Um, and um, we're, ne we, we're going to try and negotiate um, opening of FTAs faster and more focused on UK priorities than the EU can deliver. But I have to say that because there are fewer and fewer countries in the world the EU does not, as either got not already got an agreement with or is in the middle of negotiating with. Um, and here's the big question in a way. I mean, can we replace whatever we lose from this current 60% of, of trade uh, or of exports um, from the countries that are left? Uh, is this going to work? Yes, that's a bit better. Um, the key point I would make here, UK possible FTA, this is, the, this, is a, this is the group of basically six countries, which I think are divine, USA, Japan, China, India, Australia, and New Zealand, um, that are not included in one of the groups up above, either EU under negotiation or um, EU FTA countries or the EU itself. Um, and the fact is that if we were just to look at the EU bit of it, or, or the EU and, and the FTAs bit of it, for every 1% that we lose from uh, those countries in, in terms of exports, we have to find 3% improvement in the, just about, just a little under, 3% improvement in the, uh, uh, the countries that we're targeting, these six countries we're targeting on, um, just to replace that 1%. Um, so it's uh, it's, an, it's an art it's an uphill uh, story. Um, I think there's one thing we must we this is focused on exports and the use of FTAs because that all sounds good and it's gains for Britain and so on. But there's going to be reciprocal market access. As for think of America first, in this. think of China first, think of India first. Um, that's three of the major uh, markets we're looking at. Um, uh, so that means that people are going to come looking for market access. That means someone's going to lose the job in all of this. Um, no one talks about that, and no one talks about the question of whether we've got the shock absorbers for displaced workers or differentially um, affected um, regions, or whether we're going to have the skills that are necessary to develop the new industries that are going to keep us competitive without access to free movement of labor in some, in some way, shape, or form. So where are we? Well, as I've said this before, I hope, our first distinct act of independent trade policy was to increase protection. So when people say this is not protectionist policy, it's not protectionist government, that's what we've chosen to do. So it's not quite clear. Um, uh, its second is that uh, more exports is really not global Britain, it's Britain first. It's distinctly Trumpian um, in this point. Um, what I've not talked about is something called trade defense, anti-dumping and so on. The one element in the Department of National Trade that's getting really built up fast is a capability in, in anti-dumping actions. That's a way of um, uh, protecting domestic industry, but also encouraging other people to look for, for preferences from you and do deals with you. Um, and finally, just to remind point, we need deep integration. We don't need shallow integration. Tariffs don't, don't do it. It's got to be in the world of, of uh, regulatory um, integration. Once you're talking about regulation, you're talking about sovereignty pulling in some way, shape, or form. It might be light, it might be heavy, but it will be in there somewhere, even if it's only mutual recognition. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, um,